Welcome in Groningen, probably one of the names that are very hard to pronounce in any language but Dutch. Groningen is one of the cities in the north of the Netherlands and I'm here at a very famous organ in the Martinikerk, which I always call uh, as a little pet my green monster. Well, let's have a look and of course we want to listen to this wonderful instrument, but first let's have a look at the organ case because it's one of the most impressive organ cases ever and it's also ancient. The oldest parts of this organ date back to the uh, 1400s, so that means that uh, a large part of the, uh, the Hauptwerk of the organ is actually still dating back to the Gothic times. So originally this was an organ completely in Gothic style, so completely flat, with beautiful doors and probably uh, it resembled probably the altar piece at the other side of the church. Of course this organ is in a main city church, so it was rebuilt many times and one of the first rebuilds that we know quite exact what happened was uh, a rebuild in Renaissance style and you can actually see the year on the organ case, it's 1542. That's the year when they changed the appearance of the organ completely, so from a flat Gothic organ it uh, was suddenly a very much alive uh, Renaissance organ case and lots of the carvings as you see today are still from that period. And that's actually quite special to look at because you can see a lot of interesting carvings apart from the normal uh, angels or little, uh, little boys with trumpets you can see interesting uh, animals that are not real at all. You can see sea monsters, dragons, uh, there are actually mermaids uh, in the middle of the organ holding trumpets and a lot of interesting carvings that are typical for the Renaissance and you can tell that the people had a lot of fun making this organ case. Actually what, what puzzles us today is what was the relation with the church because these kind of fun animals you don't really uh, think of as appropriate in church, but actually that's what makes this organ so special. And of course you have to imagine that in Renaissance times uh, a lot of the music that was played on the organs was not necessarily church music, but also all kinds of dances and folk songs that organists made variations on, very much like uh, the bells in the tower. Well, after the Renaissance times, um, the organ got quite bad at the end of the 1600s, so it needed big repairs. And the local organ builders were, were, not, were not really capable of doing that, so they invited the most famous organ builder uh, in those days, Arp Schnitker, to come to Groningen. Of course, Hamburg and Groningen, that's not too far apart. And actually, they're both uh, Hanseatic cities, which means they had good contacts and they really knew exactly what was going on in the main cities. So it was not that much of a step to invite a German organ builder here. So Arp Schnitke came here. Um, he had a good look at the organ and in a very short amount of time he was capable of repairing the organ and made it much better. And the people here were so much impressed that the city council of Groningen gave him the order to enlarge the organ as well. And that's where the very famous pedal towers with a principal 32 at the side of the organ uh, come from. And that's actually still until today the only surviving principal 32 from Arp Schnitke. So that's a very important year. It was 1692 when he finished the job and then the organ was transformed from a very vocal sounding Renaissance organ into a modern North German Baroque organ. What is actually quite spectacular is that Schnitger didn't make his pedal towers in the style that he was used to. If you see, for example, the organ of Lüneburg, um, the organ where Georg Böhm was the organist, you can see that a student of Schnitger, one of his pupils, Matthias Dropa, enlarged the Renaissance organ with pedal towers and he just made it in his own style. So it doesn't have any connection to the organ whatsoever. It's still very impressive, but you can clearly tell it's a different style. But here Schnitger adapted the pedal towers to the rest of the organ, so you actually have 32 foot pedal towers in a kind of Dutch Renaissance style, which makes the organ even more special. Then when you look at the Ruppositive you can tell that that's again a complete different style, because the son of Arp Schnitger, Frans Kaspar Schnitger, made a new Ruppositive, it's actually huge, it has 16 stops only in the Ruppositive, 
which means that after that rebuild, the repositive was actually the largest part of the organ, the first manual, and then the pedal with 15 stops, and then the Hauptwerk. So that's quite special to have a big repositive. After Frans Kaspar Schnitker, Albertus Antoni Hinz also worked on it and enlarged it. So uh, the organ actually reached it, its pinnacle in 1740 when the last rebuild was done by Hinz and the organ was a complete musical work of art in one style, more or less. Of course, after that the organ had, had some rebuilds too. It actually came to the point that there was an electric console sitting in the church on a balcony so that you could play it from pretty far away. Uh, but you can imagine that an old organ like this with that many rebuilds and electrical action, it wasn't a very good marriage, so that didn't last too long. And we thank it to two very important people that the organ is uh, in the wonderful state it is today. First of all, the consultant, Cor Etzkes. Um, he was here, uh, he, a church-going person here all his life in this church. He knew the organ very well and he did research on every pipe in the organ and made sure that he knew exactly which parts were old, which parts were added later. And he made a plan how to reconstruct the organ. And then uh, organ builder Jürgen Arendt from Germany came in to do the actual restoration work. They finished in 1984 and I think still until today this is one of the best reconstructions ever because you can't really tell which stop is new, which stop is old. For example in the root positive is a wonderful four-foot flute and only one pipe survived and they did a reconstruction of the entire stop after that one pipe and you can't tell which pipe is the old one. Uh, the same for all the, the upper work in the organ, all the mixtures, uh, they are completely in style. Most of them are completely new. Uh, a lot of the reeds are made new, but it's really, you, you can't tell which ones are actually new, which ones are old. So finally we have here an organ that's uh, really wonderful in style because you have some stops from the Gothic times even, so those, those are sounds that are around for 500 years already. We have quite some Renaissance foundation stops, we have quite some Baroque stops, some completely from Arp Snitker, then from the generation after Arp Snitker, and some reconstructed stops. And finally, the organ is really a, a unity. It's a wonderful Baroque organ. Well, enough talking, let's hear some of the sounds. And I'd like to start with probably the oldest stop in the organ. The facade pipes in the Hauptwerk are still from the Gothic times. You can also see the wonderful shape of the mouth, uh, completely in Gothic style. It's pure lead. There is a tin foil on the pipes, so they are, look very shiny. But on the back side of the pipes, you can see that it's very dark lead. And that also gives it a very distinctive sound, a very old, profound sound. And like I said, it's around for 500 years already. Thank mm -hmm. you. can imagine a sound with this amount of resonance into the church. It supports the entire sound of the organ and also for the congregational singing, which is very important uh, today still. Uh, it's a wonderful stop to have. Well, then we go to one, probably the most famous stop of the organ, and that's the whole flute eight foot in the Oberwerk. That's a Renaissance stop. It's very wide. It's also pure lead, an open flute. And the beauty of this organ is that the Hauptwerk is in itself already powerful and impressive, but the Oberwerk is actually just a little extra to the Hauptwerk. So it's very loud in the church, and of course that has to do with the fact that the chest of the Oberwerk is pretty much near the ceiling of the church. So the stone ceiling amplifies the sound into the church in a very spectacular manner. And that's also what happens to this flute. So this one flute, which is in itself already very powerful, but it fills the entire church by itself. So it's quite a spectacular sound. The whole flute 
of de openwerk. The same thing happens when you uh, pull the uh, prestant, the principal eight foot of the Oberwerk. It's actually uh, a wonderful stop that starts with only one rank, then in the second octave two ranks, and then in the treble it's three ranks even. And the same thing happens, it gets amplified by the ceiling of the church. So also this one principle, it fills the entire church. Just for fun, listen what happens when I only pull four stops in the Oberwerk. So the principal eight, the octave four, the mixture and a trumpet 16, which is also quite special to have in the Oberwerk of the organ. But like I said, it's actually an extension to the Hauptwerk more or less. But this is only four stops and you hear a huge organ sound. Something that's also very interesting is to compare the eight foot principles of this organ because, like I said, the root positive of the organ is clearly a, a late baroque sound. So you could compare that more or less to, to a violin. It's, it's more uh, an instrument and it's very slender and it has a beautiful uh, sound. The principle of the Oberwerk is more the vocal renaissance sound. So it's really like comparing a choir to some violins. So let's listen to the difference between the Oberwerk and the Ruk Positief. Uh, and by the way, you can also see that the stops of the Ruk Positief are actually situated in the Ruk Positief, which is very normal here in Groningen. Uh, and it actually helps the organist because it's very easy to see which stops belong to which part of the organ. And otherwise you would have such an amount of stop knobs here that it's very uh, difficult to find things. So I actually like it a lot that you have the stops of the Ruk Positief in the case of the Ruk Positief. It's one of the many things that makes this organ so wonderful and so special that you have so many different stops from different periods. They all mix very well, but in the meantime you can clearly tell that these two principles are so different and you can use them in very different ways and both are beautiful. What is also a very beautiful thing on this organ, if you couple all the principles, so let's couple the principles from 32 foot, the famous one from Schnitger. Uh, together with the 16 foot stops and the 8 foot stops and we couple everything. So these are only principles and you'll hear that you can actually accompany a singing congregation easily with only a few stops because every principle has such a rich sound that it, it fills the space quite easily. So these are all the principles 32, 16 and 8 together.
principle 32 is actually not all the way till C because, well, there's no space in the church. Uh, that's actually one of the things I like here. The church is pretty big and the acoustics are really wonderful, but it's not so big that you can have an organ like St. Bavo Haarlem that doesn't fit in. So Schnitker was only able to build it up to F and it's actually quite impressive if I play it until the low F. So it's quite impressive uh, to, to support the entire sound of the organ. Uh, normally when you would build it all the way till C you needed pipes of about 10 meters high and that's not possible here but it also means the church is not too big so both visual and also to listen to the organ it can fill the space easily it, it really takes up all uh, well it, it's easy to, to uh, dominate the church this way both to see and to hear the organ so that's what I like here when you have a church that's really huge, it's almost impossible to build an organ that can fill the space. All right, let's go to some of the softer stops of the organ, because uh, apart from the very loud, impressive whole flute in the organ, we have some very delicate soft flutes. And two of them can be found in the root positif. For example, this wonderful Ruhr flute, the chimney flute. It has a very distinctive sound uh, and it's one of my favorite flutes in the organ actually. And this one is very interesting to compare with the other eight foot flute in the root positive, the Bourdon, which has a much more uh, uh, profound sound. It's also pure lead, quite white, and it doesn't have a little chimney like the Ruhrfluit. And one of the wonderful solo combinations you, you can make here is this bourdon together with a nazat, uh, a three-foot flute, and a tremulant. Then you have a very nice singing effect. So you could really say that the root positive is kind of the soloist of the organ. There is an endless range of possibilities there to make beautiful solo sounds. One of the flutes that's also worth mentioning is the four foot flute in the root positive. And that's the flute uh, what I told you about that there was only one surviving pipe. Uh, but it has a very special sound and that has to do with the shape of the pipe. It's tapered, but then again it goes up like this. So uh, it's, it's a flute you don't see every day and also the sound is quite spectacular. That's only a few flutes, but I can't, of course, demonstrate every stop. So let's go to the reeds of this organ. And there's quite a special set of reeds. Let's start with probably the most special one. Uh, it's called a viola di gamba on the Hauptwerk. And normally you would expect a string stop uh, that would be called viola di gamba. But this is actually an invention from Franz Kaspar Schnitker. He also made the same stop in Zwolle and in Alkmaar. Uh, it's a reconstruction here, but it has a very distinct, distinct sound. And 
and listen what happens when I combine it with the colorful Quinta Dana 8 and a 4 foot flute. Lots of colors you can make with small reeds like that. Another small reed, even smaller than this one, is the Vox Humana in the Oberwerk, so by itself it's not that loud. But if you combine it with that very loud 8 foot flute, there is also a Nasat 3 foot, and you add a Tremulant, then suddenly you can imagine why they actually call it a vox humana, a singing voice, because it really st starts singing into the church. And if I make it even a bit louder by adding some stops of the Hauptwerk, and if I accompany it on the root positif, there is really quite a special sound. That's actually one of the <coughs> sounds that you can immediately recognize the organ of the Martini Kerk, because that's so typical for this room and this organ. Well, some of the bigger reeds, we have trumpets 8 and 16. The 8 foot is still from Schnitker in the Hauptwerk and uh, 16 foot in the Oberwerk. Uh, especially when you couple them, you have this special effect of a big brass ensemble. Even the rook positive has an 8 foot shalmai, so a kind of a narrow trumpet, and also a 16 foot bassoon. The pedal is actually quite special, it has two 16 foot reeds, one is the bazuin, which is the, the, the biggest one, it's very loud actually. And then for softer combinations there is also a dulcian, which is also a bassoon 16 foot. And there is actually a complete range, and that's typical for a North German Baroque organ, a 16 foot, a 8 foot, a 4 foot, and a 2 foot reed. And typical for North German organs, the 4 and the 2 foot are called cornet, which has nothing to do with the French cornet that you have in the manual as a solo stop, but it's actually a small reed in the pedal. And of course that's typical for a North German organ too, this is only part of the pedal. The pedal is completely independent, so no pedal couplers necessary. And the pedal has uh, principles, flutes, uh, its own mixture, uh, so you have all the stops you need. So if I pull full pedal you have an, an organ on its own. The 
beauty is also because how the, the pedal towers are placed at, at both sides of the organ, uh, it's always very clear. So if you play a huge Bach fugue or something, every voice can be followed. So for uh, polyphonic playing, it's really ideal to have an organ like this. Well, since we have this big sound, uh, let's listen to the plenum of the organ too. And there's always a special trick here, because I demonstrated already the four stops of the Oberwerk. Uh, that's already a big plenum. But you can couple down here from the Oberwerk to the Hauptwerk to the Repositiv. So let's see what happens uh, if I start on the Oberwerk, then I go to the Hauptwerk, and then finally to the Repositiv, and then you can hear full organ. <laughs> 